How's it going? My name is Davis Breimer. I'm a second year computer engineering student here at UCSB. I've been involved in the technology management program for two years now, starting my freshman year last year. Um, I'm also a co-host on the radio show On the Edge on the FM radio station here on campus. Joining us tonight, we have two panelists. First, we have Stephen Cooper, a UCSB alum who is chairman and CEO of Skylar Technologies and chairman of Inigen. Mr. Cooper is involved in several entrepreneurial areas and some of, sexes, some of his successes include, I'm sorry, engineering and management positions for Intel, various positions including president and COO with Silicon Systems Incorporated, president and CEO of Bipolar Integrated Technology, and chairman, president, and CEO of eTech Systems Incorporated. On top of Mr. Cooper's extensive list of experience in the business world, he is also a tremendous mentor and supporter of UCSB programs. We also have with us tonight Gail Wilson Steele, a graduate of Stanford University and CEO of MedSeq Incorporated. Ms. Wilson Steele has been working in cyberspace nearly her entire career. She has helped establish Mortgage Online, a branch of Wilson Lewis Incorporated, contracted through America Online to publish Fine Foods a la Modem, which is in essence a virtual farmer's market for gourmet foods. She has used her concept that the internet puts computers to work doing what they do best to help build MedSeq Incorporated into the dynamic enterprise that it is today. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome our guest panel. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this, I guess I haven't been instructed in this, so we'll hope, whoa, let's see, next. There we go. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I have been actively involved with the technology management program and its predecessor SEAM for uh, about the last three years. It's been a real pleasure. And to have the opportunity to talk about um, the software area, which uh, is just one of many entrepreneurial activities that I've been involved in, is uh, a real pleasure. I don't want to turn this into a uh, advertisement, but I do want to tell you a little bit about um, Skylar so you understand the differences between Skylar and MedSeq. Uh, Gail is uh, much more experienced in the software area than myself. However, uh, uh, we have some interesting aspects to what we're doing. Oh, well, let's, I should be. Just the right click button, I think I'll do it. You should be, uh, which one? Okay, we'll see. Skylar's mission is to create superior value for our customers, uh, shareholders, and employees by developing, um, patenting, and marketing software or, <laughs> software or hardware solutions uh, for solving computation and complex hierarchical problems, thus enabling innovative products across the broad spectrum of technologies and markets. And that's a mouthful. Um, I'd normally be able to say it from uh, memory, but uh, as a result of having modified it a number of times over the last six months, it's, uh, it's changed and morphed a little bit. Um, basically, what we do is we have uh, some technology in tree algebra that allows us to uh, take something like a family tree and represent it, if, if you want to look at the simplest case, represent that as a natural number. And we can also represent it as a string. And then uh, any tree can be operated on with simple mathematics in order to find things within the tree. And every computer, or most hierarchical systems uh, are tree-based, and many computers can be, or graphs even, can be represented as trees. And using this technology, we feel that we can uh, highly accelerate computing activities. So um, just to go through a few of the salient points that uh, we have in the technology, um, we're, we're developing a patent portfolio, which is extremely important. It's the number one goal for the company. And we expect to grow the business through licensing and uh, also development contracts, uh, possibly even uh, hardware sales in the future. We want to be recognized as a leader in supplying these enabling solutions, and we expect to collaborate with uh, industry uh, leaders in developing uh, 
development contracts for new capability. We also uh, pursue the government because some of the applications uh, relate to homeland security and other things. The current status of the technology is that we've uh, completed uh, phase one patents and uh, we have code development to demonstrate that. We are doing demonstrations on edge labeled trees. So if you see, look at a family tree and you were to put information on the edges of those trees connecting the nodes, which would be your parents or children or grandchildren, um, we can put information of various sorts in there and that creates uh, compression capability. Um, our applications demonstrations will be available uh, this quarter in bioinformatics and we're working with Dr. Singh at uh, UC Santa Barbara as a consultant to Schuyler. We're also working on spam filters, which is a, I'm sure would please a lot of people in this room, uh, certainly me, and XML query uh, accelerators. So the company was uh, incorporated in August of uh, 2003, so it's just a little over a year old. Had angel funding to date, uh, part of that mine and we're developing demonstrations for corporate development contracts in Series B. Um, what I'm going to uh, talk about a little bit, uh, what's the same and what's different about software startups. As I made this presentation, I realized that there's more the same about technology startups in general than there are differences. Uh, and probably is one of the reasons that has enabled me to be successful in a variety of activities. I started out in the meatpacking business after I got out of the Air Force working for my father-in-law. And uh, I've been in semiconductors, I've been semiconductor equipment, I've been in uh, um, medical device area with Inogen, which is uh, tremendously successful. Shipping this month, uh, it was a winner of the 2000 in one business plan competition. And uh, now I'm in a software startup. So some people would say I'm not qualified to do that, but it's uh, been a lot of fun. There are many uh, different software business models. Ours is uh, structured around uh, intellectual property and licensing that and providing, enabling technologies to other companies. We don't see selling to the end customer. So we will work with corporations. Um, this is going to be much different than what uh, is contrast from Gale. We also, um, an advantage software business is the fixed capital requirements are much less. So you can start a, a software company with one individual. Um, much different than if you start a manufacturing company such as a semiconductor operation. Um, I'm sure that uh, you realize that Intel and those companies have to spend a tremendous amount on capital each year. Another thing, uh, technology versus market focus. Um, we started out having a technology um, and more recently have focused on the market. This is not what I recommend. Um, the only people that should do that are experienced entrepreneurs that can afford to lose the money associated with that. It turns out that, that we have some mathematics and we have methods and processes to use that and therefore we're willing to take the risks in order to develop it towards a broad spectrum of market opportunities. And just recently we brought in our, our Director of Marketing and Business Development to um, research those opportunities and where we should go first. Uh, Inogen, in contrast, and I believe Gail will talk about this, um, started out with a problem. And this is the way I'd recommend every entrepreneur start. What problem are you trying to solve? Specify what the requirements are, and then go find the technology or the, um, the means to solve that problem. And in Inogen's case, it was incredible that uh, it was a, a mature market that wasn't doing uh, much, hadn't been innovated in a long time, and uh, there really was uh, commodity pricing. They came in, designed from the ground up uh, a system that would solve the portable uh, market, which really didn't exist at the time and will sell a product at many times what the current systems are 
are sold at. So they created uh, a market for their product and uh, probably will put many of their competitors out of business. Um, another thing I wanted to talk about uh, just briefly was technology development and how it diver differs from product development because this is the people that you're going to be hiring. Technology development is the creative aspect and if you are very leading edge technology oriented, you have to have those scientists or technologists in your organization. Product development is taking an idea and a specification and turning it into something a customer can use. Much different activities. The technologists need more freedom to create. The product people need to hold a budget. They need to hold a time frame much, much closer. And so in staffing your organization is something you have to look at. And in software organizations, in most cases, both will exist. But they're different kinds of people. Personnel retention, uh, we talked about what kind of people uh, you hire. Um, it's dependent on the environment. Um, in past experiences, I've gone into dysfunctional organizations and turned those around. Uh, if you provide the right environment, uh, it won't be a, a money issue. It will be uh, because you like working with your fellow employees. In the early days of Intel, we used to hire way below, uh, actually at less salary than the person had made previously, just so that they could join Intel and work with the scientists and individuals that were in that organization. So you can create an environment where people will practically work for free. Um, one example of that is uh, I had an incredibly talented facilities director who was heavily recruited by General Electric to be a vice president. And uh, despite our encouragement to take that job, she stayed with the organization because she really couldn't leave the people or what she had there. It was just too important to her. And it was for a hell of a lot more money and uh, a tremendous opportunity. So it's the environment you create. Uh, funding's all about risks. Uh, I know everybody um, is interested in how you fund an activity, but today venture capital is not a risk-taking venture. Uh, it's a sure thing that they're betting on. So there are plenty of good ideas out there in the software area, but there are not enough people that understand and how to, to take that idea and take it to market and make it successful, to raise the money, to hire the right people, and to continue that product on. Um, so what you have to do um, is, if you've got a product and you're profitable, venture capitalists are, are generally willing to invest, although they'll take a large portion of that. If you're starting out and have an idea, they're going to take a large portion, depending on the risks. And I advise you to try and uh, find angel investors. Uh, Inogen was an angel investor um, startup. I happen to be the angel in that case. Um, Skyler is an angel investor startup. I'm one of the angels, but not all of the angel. Um, and there are a number of people in Santa Barbara and throughout the country that are doing these kinds of investments. Um, finally, and I'll, I'll leave some other comments, uh, I want to get on to Gail, but, um, whoa, I, okay, am I going back, let's see, yeah, I'm going backwards, huh, somehow. There, whoops. Previous, there we go. Okay, uh, I just wanted to uh, mention something that you need to keep in mind in any venture that you start out with. This was a direct quote from a venture capitalist of, uh, um, in, when we were interviewing to fund a company, not Inogen or, or uh, Skyler, but there must be a working prototype that proves both the technology and allows for an estimate of the value to the customer. 
the customer is the ultimate um, decision maker here. And if it's not a value, no one's going to invest in it. They have to understand the product, so it can't be so complex. No matter how complex the technology might be, you need to bring it down to day-to-day -day terms. And then finally, we have to complete due diligence on the management team. And I can't emphasize enough the importance of having experienced people in the management team. Intergen started out with really just one CEO, Kathy O'Dell, in the management team with real experience, and three students, new graduates, well, even before they were graduates of UCSB. And that was a startup team, and that lasted for um, nine months or more before we hired the first person in. So if you've got one seasoned individual, it can be done. Okay, I'm going to turn that over to Gail now and let her talk. Thanks, Stephen. See how many times we can go around on this again. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. It's good to be here. It's nice to see all these future technologists. Um, there's so much talk about hiring and not enough resources out of there. And I think the program that we have here um, at UCSB is really excellent, mis mixing the concepts of engineering and science with business. We find in our company, even at the lowest, and I don't mean to use the word lowest, but even in the most keyboard-based jobs where we have programmers who are writing code all day long, the ones who understand the relationship of what they're doing with business and with the customer are the ones that really add the most value to our organization. Now, we'll start with a mission statement. And fortunately for us, our mission statement has been the same for the entire time that we've been in business. It's just that the uh, healthcare industry has changed, the internet has changed, and technology has changed. But we like to stick with integration, in, innovation and integrity. I'm going to show you something that nobody has seen yet before because it's just come from our marketing people. Um, having more of a marketing background, I, I focus a lot on this. But it should give you a pretty quick two and a half minute um, overview of what MedSeq does and how we service the customer and where we are today. Uh, it's a little rough because it still isn't in its final form, but uh, you can tell me whether you think we'll sell anything off of this. Part of our concept is we're trying to be paperless, and so we're trying to make all our marketing materials paperless as well. So let's see how this works. We haven't got the logo in there, it looks. In April 2004, the White House announced a series of policies to transform healthcare through health information technology. The vision is of a healthcare system that gives patients information they need to make clinical and economic decisions in consultation with dedicated healthcare professionals. The world has embraced the web technology revolution, arranging travel, managing personal financing, and researching everything from car purchases to buying a home can be done confidently and efficiently from a computer on the web. Healthcare should be no exception. The time has come to give your patients the information they need to make good health decisions. Soon users will demand this capability from all healthcare providers. MedSeq began delivering Internet healthcare solutions in 1996 and today provides over 400 hospitals with interactive websites. The Henry Ford Health System, serving over 2.5 million patients annually, communicates with their community using a MedSeq website, provides their employees with a MedSeq intranet, and interacts with their patients using a secure MedSeq patient portal. The Ottawa Hospital uses MedSeq technology for forms management on their intranet while pediatrician Alan Green receives a half million visitors a month on his MedSeq built portal. Two main factors contribute to MedSeq's ability to deliver competitively priced quality web portals. The industry's number one health portal manager, namely SiteMaker CMS, and our own proven solution delivery methodology. By applying the right tools with an experienced team and a good process, MedSeq is able to design and deliver the best solutions for your needs. We also have an arsenal of pre-programmed functional modules allowing for the rapid development of custom sites, including nurse scheduling, policies and procedures, 
position lookup, and events management systems, all designed with a hospital in mind. Human resources can access information in their employee management systems. The call center can register web visitors for classes or make online referrals. And physicians can securely share lab test results with patients online. We believe that through understanding comes empowerment, and that's why we empower your webmasters and content managers with simple-to-use content management tools, and your developers with application programming interfaces built into our SiteMaker software. Hospital employees are empowered by rapid access to information across departments, and physicians will receive remote access to clinical data. And most of all, the healthcare consumer is empowered. When you offer health content and a way to engage your organization online, you give patients the information they need to work closely with you to make better health decisions. We are a cost-effective solution and partner to your web technology needs in these important coming years. Whether your goals are to streamline and integrate your operations, or to establish yourself as the high-touch, high-tech, and high-access hospital in your market, MedSeq's extensive experience will help you drive the technical innovation you need to stay ahead in business. Learn more about MedSeq's solutions by signing up for our online webinar that will fully explain our answers for your e-health transformation. If you know of an associate who could benefit from this information, click here to forward this message. Thank you. We're hoping for viral marketing here. We want everyone to click here, forward the message to another person in the hospital, and get us business that way. Um, this is where we are today. And you can tell from the first part of this that we're trying to apply the same technology um, innovations to healthcare that have already been, been added to a lot of the businesses that we have. Um, buying books online, travel. These are all examples that we realize have changed the way we do this um, interaction with, with those businesses. Uh, healthcare is moving towards that self-service model. The data is there. The technology delivers there. The real work is in the business process of integrating these changes into the healthcare system. But let me tell you about how we started, because I know a lot of you are going to be thinking about how you started a business, and um, ours was not nearly as sophisticated as what you've seen from what Stevens presented. When we started in 1995, it was all about the Internet. The Internet was the big, scary place. The dot-com was just starting, and you could barely say healthcare and Internet in the same breath but what somebody wanted to give you money. So we started with a cocktail napkin. This was our business plan. And I sat with an angel investor who was someone I knew from someone I knew through, through Stanford, actually. And he said, so what's your vision? And we said, well, we want to publish physician websites. Hmm, he said. Sounds interesting. How much do you want to charge? $200 a page. Really? And how many are there out there? So we were very conservative. We said, well, if we paid, had 450,000 MDs and they got 15% of market share, that's $13.5 million right there. He said, do you have a recurring revenue model? You bet. We're going to charge them $50 a year to host it, and that's another $3 million. And that's just the first year. That's only the first 15%. So he said, great. Figure out the valuation of your company. We used a very scientific method, and we came up with $400,000. So our first angel financing round was $80,000, and Bob got 20% equity ownership. We spent the entire year trying to sell physician web pages. And at the end of the year, we had sold 11. No, we didn't sell them. We gave them away, because that's when everything was given away free. Um, it just wasn't taking off. And we had burned through our $80,000, and we, we absolutely couldn't figure out what to do next. There was the technology partner, David Ross, who was building these websites, myself, who was trying to sell them. And then a voice came along. the telephone and said, you know, I've been seeing that you're trying to sell physician web pages, and I um, know a lot of physicians. Could I try selling some for you? And we looked at each other and said, yeah, for commission only. And so Peter Kuhn, the next addition to our company, started trying to sell these pages, and he called back and said, you know, these aren't selling. Do you have anything else to sell? This was the key to the way we thought. We said, well, we've built some websites. And so he went to his neighborhood hospital and he sold them the first website we ever sold. We went back to the board. We said, we think we found it. We want to sell these to hospitals, not to physicians. And they said, OK, well, if you can get some deals by Q1 of next year, we'll give you a little more money. And so we continued to work that way. 
um, building web pages, increasing our prices, increasing our customers, and increasing our competency. In the process of developing these websites, we had to develop our own internal processes for building them because when you build them one by one by hand, they're terribly hard to support. And so we started to think not just like a service company, but like a company that needed to have some processes. And we developed our own little toolkit that we used internally. It was basically a content management system and it was driven off of data-based content, which at that point was pretty innovative. And this is why we could do it less expensively than the hospitals could, because we had this tool, until a hospital came along and said, we want to buy your tool. And we sat back and we thought, whoa, sell them our tool. Well, I mean, it was buggy, it barely worked. Should we productize it? That was our next decision. But our biggest problem with that is, how can we make money if we give our customers the tool, because that's how we make money? And we took a giant leap there and decided, let's empower the customers to do this work, and they'll come back to us and ask us to build something else. And so our first customers started building their own websites, and we had the job of productizing our process. That was the first time we had to think about being a software company. We started looking at how real software companies um, work, and we realized that it was all dependent on David Ross to build the software. It was totally ad hoc, and he presented it whenever he came up with it, and nothing was under control. We were a pure seat-of-your-pants software company. Um, we've spent a lot of time studying what it takes to be a better software company, and, and Stephen's absolutely right. If we'd had some expertise at that point, we would have gotten through this, but instead we took on a culture of becoming a learning company, and this is still something we talk about. We read books, we took classes, we studied these things, we hired people that we thought could come help. But the startup mentality is very different. We hired a lot of people who were used to having big budgets and proper processes that walked away from us after six weeks and said, I can't deal with this chaos. I mean, you guys are going to have to figure this out on your own. And so that was basically where we were. We were bootstrapping it, our customers were paying for our product development, and we had to figure it out as we went along. We discovered in what we were delivering that we didn't, that the most important part was that we brought our customer into the process of our software development because our customer is where we were getting our ideas. Unlike Stephen who had a technology and he said all I have to do now is take this great idea and sell it to customers, we kept going to our customers and saying what do you want? We'll sell it to you, we'll build it for you. And so our, our sales team is very much the voice of the customer bringing it back to us and telling us what the customer needs to help solve the problems. And our software products very rarely go out. Our solutions very rarely go out ready to go the first time. They go through a very large and circular reiterative process where we keep talking to the customer, how does this work? And because we have the luxury of being in web-based technology, which is pretty quick to build, um, we're able to do this quickly and cost-effectively. Um, we learned that gathering good requirements is huge, and it really boils down to um, communication. We, we sent our team to requirements training classes, weeks of them, understanding why, how to define a requirement, the why and the what and the how well and the design. Uh, the whole term of a use case was something we'd never thought of before. We started bringing in customers themselves to tell us, how would you use this? And, and this is how we continue to develop products today. When we tell a hospital that we're going to build them a website, we know that we have a content management solution. But when they tell us that they want to do online billing, we have to understand first what that means to them. Does that mean your customer is going to come on and look at your hospital billing system? Or does this mean that he's just going to get a chance to view a bill on a PDF and send you some money? Is the money that comes in going to be integrated into your account system? Or is it going to be something that someone on the other end actually prints off and data enters into it? The costs are all dependent on how much you want this to integrate. And we can't answer those questions for our customers. We have to work with them and get their requirements in order to do it. And then when we build it, we have to show it to them and say, does this work for you? So this is probably the most challenging part of our software business, and that is gathering the requirements from our customers. Um, the other thing that we've realized is that our teams are not silos in the organization. The information that comes from the sales team is really our product development information. The um, 
technologists, the, the programmers, develop things based on requirements that are gathered by the project management team. The project management team has to depend on um, the customer to get and the customer's feedback to this. And it's, it's very interrelated. We, we spend a lot of time thinking about how the teams need to communicate without spending the whole time in meetings. Um, we've learned that trust is the foundation of the team and therefore has become the foundation of the culture we try to have in the company. Um, that listening is the key to gathering requirements and to understanding those problems that you're trying to solve that there is no ego, everybody has got a role and a good and, and a purpose and that it takes a whole team to make it happen. Um, aligning our goals is something and in the end our goal has to be what's best for the company and that means what's best for the customer. So we're again very customer focused and we want to have the results that make our customers successful, that make us able to maintain the products that we deliver to them and that make us feel good about the work that we're doing. The company has grown one customer at a time. Now you have to remember that we're a dot-com survivor, which meant that we did this uh, in a very bootstrappy mentality. And even now, I mean, I can't, no, I won't go there. I won't tell you the way we save money, like sharing rooms when we're on the road if you're with, with a guy who doesn't snore. Uh, not me, but the salesman, you know, the sales team. Uh, but there, it, it really was not something where we threw a lot of money at this. At the same time, I think it saved us because our competition ended up going away during the dot bomb because their, their cash flow was so strong. They had so much money going out. The hemorrhaging of cash was so huge that they couldn't turn it off fast enough. And bought, basically, they ran out of money. And I was, I was telling Stephen, sometimes it's not how good a company you are, it's how bad your competition is. I mean, we are literally one of the last companies standing. There are three people in our space right now, three companies in our space delivering these services, and there were dozens and dozens before. We have a, a patient board that says, you know, build your company brick by brick, brick one customer at a time. Um, the trends are where we want them, and the key to success and survival, survival, should I say, is profitability and positive cash flow. So we've kept our eye on that line to make sure that that's there. This has won us three years of um, being on the Deloitte Technology Fast 50 for Los Angeles, and those are the top Fast 50 tech companies that have entered into this contest. And they did a survey um, for their CEOs, and they asked which factor has contributed most to the growth of your company. And exceptional or unique products is definitely on the top of that, 24%. The second one is high quality employees. So you can see that a good idea and the right people mixed with some good strategy is, is really key. And then timing is also key. And so um, having a way of being in, getting into the market and being flexible once you are in the market helps you to fit your product and your services into the timing that the market is ready to take. And finally, the survey asked CEOs, to what do you attribute your own personal success? Now you have to remember when you think back to the founding of this company, it was founded, you know, <laughs> Your introduction was great, David, but when you said that uh, my experience in business was, through, was during the internet, that kind of dates me to about, what, 10 years of business experience, because that's all only how old the internet is. Um, but it's true, you took a, you know, an entrepreneurial housewife, you took this software partner of mine who was really, he was an architect and an artist by trade, and the first book we bought in the company was HTML for Dummies. And that sales guy who called, who's now president of the company, he's a tennis player. So you took a company, you started with a housewife, an artist, and a tennis player, and you built it into a real business with people who have jobs. We had eight babies born in our company last year. I consider that a very low-cost way of growing your, your team. But also, it shows that people are making this business, uh, uh, it's their life, and they're enjoying it. So the answer to the question, what do you attribute your personal success from these CEOs, 26% sheer determination and 21% entrepreneurial spirit. 
And then back to timing, being at the right place at the right time. So I'm sure that within this group here, you probably can all say, yeah, I've got the two main ingredients that it takes to make a company. Thank you. Um, can I make a couple of uh, comments? I, I uh, wanted to add uh, a few things um, about uh, entrepreneurial activities. You know, there's a lot of, of good ideas out there, uh, and software is not uh, the only area that, that has good ideas. But if you don't combine that with good leadership uh, or management, then it's not going to succeed. And venture capitalists will tell you that they turn away thousands and thousands of uh, good opportunities before they really take one on. And so it's not the lack of good ideas that are out there, but it's people that can make it happen. And then if you get the right people, you can attract the money that you need to uh, actually take that forward and they'll spend it wisely. And undercapitalization is a, a key reason for many companies not succeeding going forward. And then, of course, you have to have a product um, that you create and it's gotta be a customer solution. Another comment I wanted to make uh, um, was to answer the question, what makes um, a startup, a software startup difficult? And again, in my estimation, it's always the people. Um, the people are the cause of the problem and they're also the cause of the success. So if you hire the right people or you associate yourself with the right people, then you have a high chance of working out no matter what the problems are. If it means you don't take salary for a couple of weeks or, or whatever, it, it'll work out. Uh, Byron Myers worked fast foods for 18 months before we could afford to pay him. Um, that's, that was a fact of life at, at uh, Indigen in the early days. Um, the other thing is that um, advisors are extremely beneficial. Every company that I've had in the last uh, 15 years or so has established a technical advisory board. You can call them whatever you want, uh, scientific advisory board, technical, medical advisory board. Um, but we have been able to go out and attract the very best of the best. And uh, some of them come out of academia. Um, in, in the case of USCSB, we have Dr. Singh, who's advising us on bioinformatics. He's basically our domain expert. And you'd be amazed at how willing these people are to get together and, uh, and contribute to your operations. So again, it's people, but it doesn't have to be people that you're paying a lot of money to or, or people that you employ. For a few shares of stock or a stipend, um, you can get the best and the brightest. And if, if you get a few of those together in a room once every six months, you won't believe what you can create. So uh, I'll, I'll end it with one last thing. Uh, another question was, what makes a startup fun? Uh, in the early days of Intel, I was there at the fifth anniversary, a uh, manager told me that um, at, at Intel we come to work and if it was meant to be fun, we charge admission. Um, the, those days, are, he was kidding in a way, but those days have changed. And my philosophy, if you're not having fun, you shouldn't be doing it. So look very carefully at what you do through life. And uh, if you're not having fun, you ought to re-examine uh, what you're doing because I enjoy everything I'm doing uh, and especially in the last three years since I've reassociated myself with the university whether it's the technology management program, the foundation or um, the various other activities in this entrepreneurial activity. Okay. Any other comments? Well, no, I think those questions? are great, but we have, we're ready for we questions. have some questions, right? Yeah. Okay. 
Great. Thank you, Stephen and um, Gail, for sharing, sharing your time with us tonight to share your experiences and knowledge. I'd like to open up a question and answer session. Uh, if you'd like to raise your hand, give me your question. I'll repeat the question so we can all hear it and then answer them. And it's Steve also, oh, not Stephen. <laughs> Yes. So do you most talk your businesses deal with other businesses that's supposed to be the end consumer? I know Gail tried to deal with physicians and stuff. I guess those could be the end consumer for maybe a consider patient. But can you talk a little bit about the pros and cons of dealing with another business versus dealing with the end consumer in a software really So the question it, can you just specify your question for me, please? Can you talk about Okay. So the pros and cons of dealing with the end consumer rather than businesses in, in between. I think the, uh, maybe I need to clarify if you mean the end consumer or the end user. The end user. Okay. Um, it, well, for us where we're dealing with a, a software that um, a, a very regular person is going to use, someone that's not necessarily technically skilled, um, having that relationship with the end user is really important because in the end it's the success of the software. And so I guess our, our software is really bent on simplifying your interaction with technology, that the technology is made to make life easier, um, not for technology's sake. That That is a different model very much from something like an embedded um, security system or something like that. So for us it's 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 important that uh, we do have a relationship with our um, consumer, our end user, because if they like it and it works for them and it makes life easier for them, then it's going to make our software better. So that's, that's an important thing for us. And in our case uh, with Skyler, we're so early in the uh, venture that uh, we haven't engaged corporations yet. One of the strategies was to get a good intellectual property position. And therefore, we're not ready to roll it out quite yet. After we have the applications demos ready uh, this quarter, that we will roll it out to corporations probably in the no November, December timeframe. Um, so we deal with domain experts that can provide the feedback to us, uh, either ac either out of academia or uh, business experts. Other questions? Right there. Both of you spoke a lot about the value of experience. I was just wondering your opinions on experience and with information through programs like the technology management program, getting classes, versus the value of being in the business, the real world kind of experience. Um, in, is that a well, Go for it. Okay. Um, the uh, technology management program. I, I think you can ask Allie and Brenton and uh, Byron, uh, is invaluable in preparing you for the entrepreneurial experience or even working in a large company where uh, in a department you'll be part of a team. All, all successful corporations today deal in teams and, and teams may not be organizationally structured, they're actually a combination of marketing and, and technology and finance and human resources today uh, so that everything is taken into account when you're developing a product. Um, the um, other aspect though that you need to add is somewhere in the organization uh, unless you're going to keep it very small for a long time and learn as you go, you need to have that level of experience, that advisor to call upon when you get stuck or to avoid the pitfalls. Uh, in, um, the lack of experience will cost you a lot of money over the time. If you have a lot of money, that's fine, but there's no substitute for having been there before and made those mistakes. I've failed a number of times in my career um, and those were learning experiences, but I had I paid for them some way. I think if I can add a comment to that, that um, along the way, we, I talked about being a learning company. It's very quick to learn from an expert who can understand your problem and, and give you the direct advice. And even if you are going to self-educate, which we've done a lot of, just even telling you what to educate yourself on. One of the things when I'm interviewing new hires though, if I've 
um, met someone who has tried his own startup business, his or her startup business, and decided that they don't want to go that way, that, that the work is not just their idea, but it's the work of selling the idea, um, doing it, and then collecting the money for it. I mean, it's so much bigger than just providing an idea or a service. They make fabulous employees because they understand business as well as whatever the skill set that the, is that they bring to the company. And they also enjoy working with other people. So I, I mean, I applaud anyone who goes out, even if it's a lemonade stand, and just understands the range of activities that need to occur for business to happen. One, one additional uh, comment is that uh, a rule of thumb is around one human resource uh, employee uh, for 50 uh, employees. Um, it's being outsourced in many cases now, but at that level, you can begin to think of internal training. And I highly encourage every successful company I've seen has had their own training program, whether they send people to classes or they create their own. It's more fun to create your own, send somebody out to a class, then bring it back and teach it internally. And you continue, that's what creates a learning organization and you train your culture in. In the early days of Intel, when it was growing so phenomenally, uh, the only reason that it had a cohesive culture was because of training. And it was required. Other questions? And I'm gonna have you speak into the mic just so everyone can hear it. Um, this is to Steve. Just in the case of Skyler Technologies, it seemed your business model was mostly focused on having a patent portfolio. What's the threat of uh, prior art, uh, other entrants with like related patents, you know, that kind of area? Other marketplaces like Europe, but it's not as easy to um, patent algorithms. Mm -hmm. uh, the question is, uh, it seems like we're uh, IP uh, focused and um, what's the uh, issue of having prior art? in this area. Um, you know, it's interesting, I'll, I'll pass something on to you that um, those of you that get involved in intellectual property and legal, your patent attorney will tell you not to look. Hmm. Um, the, if you don't know that the prior art exists, you're better off. Uh, I've never quite understood that. Uh, I understand the, the idea. But um, if you're a domain expert, in your particular technology. In the case of ours, we have a scientist who is uh, UC Berkeley, PhD, spent his entire life, last 35 years, in mathematics, basic logic. And um, the discoveries that he has uh, made are not contained in any of the literature that we're aware of, and four patents have been issued uh, along those. Uh, based on that. We have another four patent filings. The key is to get the disclosures out and with your attorney so that um, you have the prior art. art. Um, all ours is core technology today. We're moving into domains such as communications and other areas to patent in that. So you have multiple patents to attack and that gives you the strength. Uh, the valuation of the company will be dependent on how many patents you have and the chances you can protect the technology. Yes. Here. You may decide that, that you want to take the trade secret route if you can keep the information tightly contained and not patent. Or you may say, I'm going to out um, perform my competition and not patent and just make it in the public domain. So there are a lot of strategies to go to. Uh, in our case, patenting happens to be the right uh, choice with a combination of trade secrets. Hi. Uh, my question is for Gail. How did management overcome the challenge of transitioning from selling products to then selling your process? And what were the challenges that were faced by, by management? The, the process that we started with was um, put into a, a software tool. So in a way, we were selling our, our process, only we had productized it into a product that enabled the flow of website development to happen. And the, um, 
the end, the sales side of the house is really the one that delivers that message to the customer. So as far as internally going from a company that does product development versus solutions for customers, um, sort of a, a blended services, it was challenging. What happens is that you set a group of people aside who are supposed to be evolving your product and along comes a screaming customer and that screaming customer takes priority. So those people who thought they were going to spend their day working on some code end up going over to fix the bug or help the customer figure out what it is that they need. And we tried a lot of different things. We opened offices in separate locations and said, okay, you guys are the technology guys, you guys are the software guys, and you people over here, you're the ones that deal with the customers. Well, software guys actually don't like dealing with customers, so we had them all wanting to be on the software team. Um, then we tried functionally separating the office. It, it just takes a really good engineering manager to keep the product board and the timelines and the engineering's time um, focused on the job that they need to do. And it takes a strong barrier between, and this isn't, no, barrier's not the right word, discipline of the sales team not to try to attack your programming resources to help their customers. Because you have to remember this, the sales team is motivated by keeping the customers happy and growing sales, and that one single customer is a commission to some sales guy. So it's not just the customer, it's the sales guy and the sales manager and everyone putting pressure on the programmer who's just trying to write some code. So it, it is, it's a constant battle, the balance between sales and implementation or sales and product development, and yet it's a, it's a healthy tension. You absolutely have to have it to keep, to keep the company going. Would you agree with that? I agree 100%. The, uh, the key is to make sure you don't release a poor product. If you, if you introduce to the market a product that has a lot of problems in it, you will end up, your whole company, including the CEO, focused on correcting that customer problem, and you won't be able to do any development. Uh, I've been there before, and it's something that we really focused on at Inogen that we were not going to introduce the product until we were positive that all possible faults had been uh, identified and it was tested to the nth degree. Because once you do that, there's, there's many downsides to having a poor product. Uh, one can be reputation, another can be lo loss of business, and uh, certainly it will interrupt your development cycle. Absolutely, and we actually have secure servers where we do our software development so the salesmen can't get in and get little sneak peeks that they do screen captures of and sell to our customers without our knowing it. So it's, it's a pretty big motivation, and, and yet you're right. The better it goes out, the easier life is. My vice president of technology development, Dr. Mark Gessley, is sitting over here with the gray hair. <laughs> and he at eTech Systems, he uh, ran about uh, several tens of million dollar uh, technology development budget. But he'll tell you he spent many weeks in the Far East solving problems when the customer screamed about a pattern generation system at Samsung or NEC or wherever. Um, everybody gets involved when there's serious problems. Uh, hello, in this sector where your workers are technology experts, and the managers probably don't fully understand what those workers are doing. How do you manage situations where you need to hire or fire or set deadlines or evaluate the work that's being done? And, and you're talking about the, the quality of the product that's being delivered to the customer? That's a good question. I can understand why you're asking it. We end up putting into the process a very strong QA process, which is supposed to happen before anything leaves the department, and, and at the quality assurance level is, is where that product is run through its testing. The project manager, the person who's working with the customer, actually has a very different skill set. Um, that project manager is, is collecting what the customer needs, reporting it to the engineering team, and then trying to make sure that what they've created and what the customer's asking for is the same thing. So it's, it's a customer um, communication issue. 
the, the timing of the delivery is really a long, uh, an engineering process where it goes through requirements, it goes through um, coding, it goes through testing, it goes through, you know, implementation. And so the, the process of the delivery is supposed to manage um, a quality delivery. That project manager does not need to know how to read code. She doesn't need to, to do that. She depends on the QA team. And I'm using she just because in our company we have more women doing that job than men. But um, it, it's her goal is to deliver something that satisfies the requirements. The, the, the harder job probably is defining the requirements in a way that both the customer and the engineer understand. There is a fallacy by many uh, technologists that uh, their management has to be uh, fully informed on the technology in order to manage the organization, even the CEO. Um, the fact of the matter is that you need uh, multiple people that understand the technology in the organization. But uh, I wasn't a great electrical engineer, I'll admit it, or a student. Um, but I am very good at monitoring progress on a program and a schedule and a budget. And if you define the requirements properly and you uh, do a statement of work and break down structure on what has to be developed and it's not happening, you can pretty well assure yourself that there's a problem somewhere here that you need to dig into. And you can be at the top of the organization and, and uh, if you have the right processes in place, you'll find that out very quickly. You know, one other comment, at the technical, at the coding level, um, something that we have worked hard on is creating coding protocols because each programmer will attack a problem differently. He'll, he'll deliver the requirement, but it will be done differently as far as the code base is concerned. And in our company, just for support issues, it's real important that if somebody leaves, you don't have to start trying to figure that out. So for us, um, that, that standardization of coding protocols was key to being able to support the products that were being delivered out of technology. Uh, Steve, regarding the Intergen matters, I'm a five-year SEAM participant, and I looked at Intergen before you picked it up. And one of the, um, I thought the idea was cute, but I didn't see it was horribly original. The thing that scared me about it was the product liability attributes. What caused you not to be afraid of that? Well, um, certainly uh, you can have a certain amount of product liability insurance. Um, fortunately, oxygen is not um, life-threatening if the device fails. Uh, people are not on this because they will die immediately, uh, generally. And matter of fact, a lot of people take it off at night and don't use it. Or uh, when they're resting, they, don't, they use it when they're active. So the liability is fairly uh, minimal. Uh, we have all sorts of alarms built into the Intigen 1 that will alert far before there is any failure of the unit um, that you need to be serviced. And ultimately, we hope to have regular feedback from the customer through uh, perhaps a, a data line or whatever, and uh, we'll actually read the data and understand exactly the status of every unit. So it's not a, a concern, really. All right, unfortunately, we have to wrap up this question and the answer session. Again, I'd like to thank Gail and Steve for being here tonight.